Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, good afternoon. And today we're excited to have Dr. Mark Keel here to discuss his career journey from academia to the founding of his startup, Genomenon. Genomenon is an AI-driven genomics company addressing the challenge of connecting clinicians with medical evidence to help diagnose patients with genetic diseases and cancer. He previously completed his MD PhD and Molecular Genetic Pathology Fellowship at the University of Michigan, where his research focused on stem cell biology, genomic profiling of hematopoietic malignancies, and clinical bioinformatics. And after spending 15 years preparing for a life of academic research, he became convinced that revolutionary change in genomics was more likely to emerge out of industry, which led to the founding of Genomenon. And if anyone has questions throughout the talk, we ask that you please hold them until the end during the Q&A session. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Keel. Thank you so much. Can my screen be seen in the appropriate mode? And I can be heard. So I love the energy, love all that buzz. I, I, I hope that we get to Q&A toward the end. If we don't, please don't be shy and, and reach out to me by email. This is something that I really like talking about. Uh, and I, I have loved all the engagements that I've had with the KGI folks, so don't be shy. Uh, I have a, a number of slides that I want to go through, and I want to keep it super informal because I feel like this kind of talk is one that I missed 10 years ago when I found a genomenon, and I would have learned a great deal in these 60 minutes and saved myself many years of heartache as I uh, founded the company. Um, and so... Far from focusing on the current success of Genomenon, which I feel like would be super stuffy and not very educative, I want to focus on where I started from and the uh, trials and tribulations that I had to undertake, especially as I was weaning myself out of academics and entering into um, the, the dark side of industry and even worse, entrepreneurship. So my purpose is to convince you of how easy it is to start a startup. And I say that in quotes. It's not as hard as you think, though it is hard, and to provide advice through my own personal anecdote. So this is not intended for you to leave the room and, and become entrepreneurs, though if you do, I'd be happy to chat with you about it. It's really meant to give you a flavor of other types of professions and avocations outside of the Ivy Tower. Uh, and I'm not going to focus so much on the genetics and genomics aspect, though you'll hear some of that. It's really meant to be a focus on the nature of starting a startup. So who, who am I? Where did I come from? A am I just a failed graduate student uh, who had no other choice? I actually did quite well in graduate school. This is one of the first papers that I published. I was fortunate enough to get it published in a high-impact journal. Uh, and what I wanted to convey with this slide is that this study which was my research work as a graduate student that culminated in designing a method to identify stem cells for, for testing. That was a very powerful learning that I, that I undertook through this process because this was very widely cited. And whereas typically scientific discovery is pretty narrowly focused on that one discovery, there's a lot more impact in your scientific finding if it has reverberations outside of itself. And one of the most straightforward ways to do that and make that happen is to devise a method. So I, without really realizing that early on, I had this epiphany when I published uh, this paper and, and, and noted how well it was received. That was in my graduate career. In my postdoc, I, I sort of carried over the idea that methods are powerful. And while I was going through my uh, graduate career, I saw and was jealous of all of the papers that were published as a result of next generation sequencing, which was a new methodology. And I, I was cut on the crook of academics. When you publish or perish, that's how you get rewarded. And I said, I want to publish more papers more, uh, that are more high impact and faster. And so I did. I learned NGS data, I learned how to process it, how to understand it, and I published a number of papers focusing on hematopoietic malignancy, you can see four of them here, and that process taught me that scale was possible within science, especially if you leverage the method. And then simultaneous to that, I, I hope I can still be heard, but simultaneous to that, um, these two gentlemen came to my attention. Uh, you probably recognize them. This is Craig Venter on the left, 
who spearheaded the private sector component of the Human Genome Project, and then Jonathan Rothberg, who invented 12 different ways to sequence a genome and spun them out into commercial entities. So both of these gentlemen uh, reified what I had learned in my own small way in my graduate and postdoc work, that methodology and scalability leads to big positive impact, and it can happen outside of academics. So um, also sort of on the tail end of that, a, a colleague of mine, a peer of mine, uh, had started a company analyzing microarray data, which uh, you'll know is a little bit uh, more of a, a earlier technology called Compendia Bioscience. And, and Dan Rhodes was in my very MD PhD program, and he was very successful in his endeavor and well respected. And similar to those papers being published with NGS, I, I thought, well, if Dan can do it, I can too. So as I was emerging from the academic cocoon and planning on a life of uh, professorship out to pasture, I, I realized that the time was propitious. I would have a life full of regret if I didn't take action and bite the bullet and actually try to start a company myself. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll, I'll share credit uh, with my co-founder, Steve Schwartz, who you'll meet a little later. This is how simple it is. Uh, when you're talking about starting a company, if you stick to this set of concepts, you'll be successful, is creating value and then realizing that value. Uh, and one of the, one of the hangups that early entrepreneurs have, and even people who are in a small business or a large business, is a focus on a product is uh, an error in judgment. The focus in everything that you do and think and convey to your potential customers uh, and your investors should be on the value that that product provides to the people you're trying to, to sell something to. So creating value and realizing value. Obviously, this is an oversimplification, but if you can remember and stick to these principles, you'll find that you meet with success much earlier. And then to complexificate it a little bit more and put more color on it, you'll notice that I've put the problem in the center of this diagram. It should not be the product. It should be the problem is what you're focused on solving and the product should spill out from that. And then, uh, then the idea comes. The idea is, is not a shower thought and you say, I wanna start a company. This is such a great idea. You should start with the problem and then have the idea flow from that. And then uh, obviously you have to have customers and you have to have cash. Otherwise you don't really have a business. You just have a hobby. And from those offshoots, you have the people who make the company run. And I've been privileged to, to meet with, and um, even from KGI, I hire a number of folks who share in my vision and love coming into work every day. And they really are Janaman, which was a great sort of turning point for me to realize, wow, this is bigger than just myself. And all of that, takes place under, under the um, uh, heading of the process. And I'm going to focus on some aspects of the process in rapid order, just so that you can have a sense for what it's like to start and run a, a small business. So focus on the product. That's what very novice entrepreneurs do. More mature entrepreneurs will focus on the problem, but I'll say serial and expert entrepreneurs will focus on the process. So that's one of the major things that I want to share with you. Anybody who has an entrepreneurial um, uh, bug is the process is what should be the most important in your mind. And if you fall in love with the process, you'll never be bored at work, even if you go through uh, lows and valleys, which you inevitably do when you're, when you're getting something like a, a startup off the ground. So let's talk a little bit about the problem that I saw. This was my life as a graduate student. I, I loved it, but it was a perverse kind of love. I knew that it, there was an easier way. And more importantly, I knew that the challenge of extracting this genomic data from multiple different sources and synthesizing it for, for providing value um, was a barrier to scale. And in particular, I had the challenge that there was all this information and evidence locked away in published resources. So not only did I need to search through a database, 
but then I needed to comb through the reference or references before I extracted any meaning out of it. And my epiphany, my idea, my shower thought was that data should come to me. Why doesn't that data come to me automatically? And so that's where I really had the idea that this idea had legs because it could provide potential value to a large number of people. So like I talked about um, Craig Venter making the human genome sequencing um, possible with the Human Genome Project, as you're all well aware, uh, and Jonathan Rothberg and the multiple NGS technology revolutions making sequencing a patient's genome in the clinic um, plausible, not just possible for $3 billion taking a decade, it was now becoming possible that we could do it in, in meaningful uh, timeframes for a meaningful price point. I wanted to turn my attention to the, the follow-on bottleneck, which was who's gonna make sense of this data? And that's where my idea focused. That was the problem that I solved is really making human genome sequencing practical. So I, I'll, again, this is um, open and honest conversation. I initially told my investors and myself and my employees, we would launch with three full-fledged products in the first year. And uh, two of them that were a major focus are shown here. One of them we didn't even turn our attention to ever, but obviously that was not ambitious is too generous a word. It was it was naive. Uh, it was very short sighted. And it turns out we didn't even release either of these, which is what we had built our investor pitch and our whole business model around. What we did, in fact, was learn that rather than build the rocket ship that you dream of when you're coming up with your idea and fantasizing about what your company will sell, we instead built the bike ramp the bike ramp that your customers need to get a foot off the ground rather than being taken to the moon. They didn't even want to go to the moon. I th thought they did. I thought I knew as a practicing molecular diagnostician, I thought I knew that everybody wanted my rocket ship, but it turned out they just wanted the bike ramp. And so this is a bit of a cliche, but it's, a, it's an informative one. Build the bike ramp, focus on the value, focus on the challenges that your potential customers are facing. Again, daydreamed about this for too many weeks. It was so beautiful. It had cool interactive movements and a lot of you know, feature repletion and nobody cared. In fact, when we first took it out to the world, they were much more interested in something that we didn't ever intend to commercialize that has now become our main uh, line of business, at least on the clinical side, that was meant to be an administrative capability. And when we were pulling up our laptop at a trade show booth, they said, yeah, that's all great. I like your rocket ship, but what about your bike ramp? because I have some speed bumps that I want to get over because they're really annoying me in, in my day-to-day -day activity. So this was that, that day at the trade show, I sketched this out on my, uh, in my hotel bedroom. And I said, this is what the customers are clamoring for. This is what we should focus attention on. And so that was a nice pivot in response to the customer. So if you haven't heard of this before, um, it, this is also an industry term in entrepreneurship called the minimum viable product. And this is what it looked like. This is a mock-up, but it looked very similar to what the functional MVP was. And I think too many entrepreneurs focus on something working. And that's the nature of the viable in this uh, concept. But just because it works, just because the website doesn't crash, doesn't mean it does anything, doesn't mean it provides value, nor does it mean anybody's going to care. And so... Um, uh, I've heard this before. I don't like the phrase particularly, but the, the phrase is, will the dog eat the dog food? If you made a batch of dog food and nobody eats it, you got to go back and remake the batch. And so as soon as you start to see customers need what you've produced, then you know that you've got some traction, something to iterate from and something to improve on. And so instead of um, considering what's a minimum viable product, you should consider what's a minimum valuable product. Not only does it work, but it works to alleviate some problem and provides clients with some value. I, I show this slide because we were at a certain critical point early in our, our history, we couldn't even give it away. Uh, uh, and so we, we had no choice but to rethink our model. Our price points were too high. Nobody wanted to talk to us. It was creating a barrier to having customers try out what we had. And so we said, we have to work really hard to get people to see this so that we can iterate and improve. Because if we're just building my vision in a vacuum, we're not going to be guided by 
uh, what the customers actually want. And so this was a very scary roller coaster ride. We could have torpedoed the success of the company by just giving away what our perceived value was, but it turned out it was a very successful pivot because we got input. We got users. We were able to gather momentum and learn from our customers. And it was, uh, it was slow and painful at, at the beginning, but it eventually grew and built on it, built on itself so that we could get to this stage where we had a minimum valuable product. However, you can't make a business by giving stuff away, or it's hard, you know, Twitter and Instagram notwithstanding. So when you're trying as a small business to stay in business, you need to make money. So when we talk about the minimum viable product being a wrong-headed way to think about it, a minimum valuable product being slightly better, the best way to think about it is what's the minimal unit that you can sell? So I like to, I, this, this is my coinage, it's a minimal sellable product. And that's what we had after giving it away for a year or so and iterating based on feedback. That should be your target as you're releasing a product into the world. And another learning that I had, I, I would often be chided in my early days by in, investors and employees by um, focusing on a potential customer's enthusiasm. I would always say, oh, we talked to you know, large clinical reference lab Y and they were really excited. And we talked to big pharma company X and, oh man, they were really intrigued by what we had. That doesn't keep your business alive. You have to know who your real customers are. And those are the people with a problem who see value in what you're providing and are willing to give you money. So until you have that, you don't really have a product. You don't really have a business upon which to build. And so when it, it seems kind of funny, like who's your real customer? Well, that should be obvious. It's actually less obvious than you think, and you should be guided by people for whom you solve problems so that they're willing to give you money for it. Uh, another concept that you may uh, encounter if you get deeper into entrepreneurship is, is your product a painkiller or a vitamin, a need to have or a nice to have? You can sell vitamins, you can make money, you can make money with entertainment products, um, products that waste people's time, but it's a harder row to hoe. It takes a lot longer to get to a viable company if you're not solving a pain. And so addressing someone's pain or their problem is the best way to ensure that you can scale as efficiently as possible. This is one of my favorite slides. I'll try to, to contain myself as I talk about this, but nobody cares about your tech. When you're talking to a customer, they don't care about your fancy AI algorithms. They don't care how long it took you to, to choose the color scheme on your user interface. Nobody cares about your tech. Your focus should be on them and their problem and how you're solving their problem. What your product can do for them, not how it does it, because that doesn't matter. And that was a very long process and evolution in my thinking. And it's still a tendency that I have to fight against because as a creator, you get enamored with what you've built. But really in your marketing, in your customer conversations, when you're talking to investors, don't linger on your tech. Focus on the value that you're providing and, and how much customers are willing to pay for it. So let's talk, I'll try to go rapid fire because I do want, if we have time to, to leave some room for questions. Businesses don't run without people. And I, as I mentioned before, I've been very privileged to, to be engaged with a number of very passionate, very high functioning folks right from the beginning. And so with that in mind, um, a startup poorly run can be a fiefdom and you can hoard equity. You can keep your company uh, uh, ownership to yourself and you could rule with an iron fist and make sure that it's your way or the highway or much more efficiently, you can find people that you trust and trust them. And um, I didn't have to learn that the hard way. That's just sort of intrinsic to my personality. Plus there's just so much to do. And it's not realistic to think that you can do it all or be good at all of it. As a, as a, a bit of a humility, I was not the best first time CEO. And I realized that I was onto something so important that I didn't want to let my 
um, inexperience get in the way of the potential success of the company that I, I was passionate about um, and, and the problems that I was really dedicated to solving. And so I fired myself as a CEO and I found somebody who I trusted, who had done it before, who I knew I could learn from and under whose guidance we could uh, actually reach the heights that Genomenon's promise foretold. And so I'm going to walk through some of the external folks that I met and the nature of their, their um, relationship with me, as well as some internal folks. I'll go through these quickly. Mentors. Um, these people were, were highly influential for me. One in academics, uh, sort of on uh, straddling the fence. She was on the tech transfer side where um, from academics, companies are born. So she was sort of beckoning me <laughs> over the fence. That's Robin on the right. And then Rich on the left was very generous uh, he's an entrepreneur himself. He didn't need to give me the time of day. He had other customers to see. And um, I think he could tell I didn't have an, enough money, but he gave me his time and that was highly valuable. And, and I'm very grateful to both Rich and Robin for helping me through my early phases and giving me the confidence and, and a little bit of a glimpse into what I needed to know to, to make my startup a success. Similarly, um, this is Norman Bill. On the left side was an i program. It's like a customer, it's like an early company boot camp that focuses on customer discovery. And they kick you out of the nest and they say, get out of your head and get on the streets and talk to real people. That was invaluable. And, and Norm, it turned out to be uh, uh, partnered with us at Genomenon in, in various ways. And he was a great early advisor as I went through the process. And Bill, too, uh, a great font of wisdom, but also he gave me some money. So early free money from the state, necessary for, for a struggling company. We built a website. We went to some trade shows, all thanks to, to Bill and some state and federal funding. Uh, and, and then similarly, this is Jack and Bradley, uh, also on the tech transfer side where Robin was. Uh, Jack spent a lot of time with me teaching me what I didn't know, talking about um, balance sheets and cap tables and marketing and making sure that your company's divisions and departments were scaling in tandem so that you didn't exaggerate one and deprecate the other. And Bradley was very helpful because he too provided funding that I applied for through my position at the University of Michigan. Uh, I coyly made the mistake of thinking that if I asked for less money, I'd be more likely to get it. And that was a silly early mistake it turns out that people with money want to give you the money you need to ensure your success. And so I only made that mistake once and, and never again. So after that, I became much more forthright with what my needs were to make the company a success. And then these are the money people, the real money people. So the venture capitalists, there's angels that, that I'll showcase later here. But Chris on the left and Jan on the right here were in the venture community that I was very fortunate to get uh, engaged with early on. And I was also able to ask very naive questions because I was a rookie and everybody knew it. And they were very generous with their time. They were, they were a little selfish too. They were sniffing out potential deals, but they did give me a good education uh, for free and, and we're still uh, colleagues to, the, to this day. And these two folks who look like lawyers, you'll be surprised to learn are actually lawyers. So um, especially early days, you need to protect yourself and um, you don't want to get in over your head. And so uh, uh, Sarah and Mike, I, I am very thankful for, although I paid them, I paid them handsomely. <laughs> I'm very thankful, though, that uh, we had such a great relationship and, and it's still our legal counsel to this day. So it's not without a cost, but especially early on, it was a good uh, legal education in the, in the process of form, forming a company. So those were all folks who were external. The people who are internal, you might gather that these are my professor co-founders because they are, uh, Kojo and Megan, they were very necessary in my, in my training as a postdoc because they gave me a lot of latitude. They had a lot of confidence in me, which was um, a surprise from my, my earlier experiences in academia. They let me do what I thought was best. They let me run with my ideas and that that freedom allowed me to come up with the, the ultimate data components and uh, product that became what our, our products look like today. So Kojo and Megan were my co-founders on the academic side. And for a while, it was just the three of us until 
I met Steve. Steve is on the left, and um, uh, Kevin was also a part of that early day. He, he built our first user interface. Uh, they were from a consultancy where I asked for help building out a software startup company where I didn't have any software or startup experience. And everybody told me I was crazy except for Steve. He rolled up his sleeves and said, how do we make this happen? And I'm forever grateful to Steve. He's our, our uh, CTO and my co-founder. He's an awesome person to have worked with. Again, I, I can't say enough great things about him. More money people, this time money, money people who actually didn't just give me advice, but they gave me money. They're investors and board members and, and um, advisors, uh, too numerous to mention, but all with their own experience and history and where you can learn from them. You can take their advice. One of the phrases that they said uh, was an important thing that they looked for when they were investing in, in entrepreneurs was coachability. If you enter into a conversation with an investor or a potential boss, if you're not going to be an entrepreneur, and there's an arrogance and a, a sort of unteachability about you, there, there, there is recognition that it's going to be a challenge to get you to grow. And I, again, took advantage of my naivety and was just a sponge and, and learned as much as I could and asked as much as I could. And I think there was a recognition on their part that that was a, a huge asset to have in an early entrepreneur. And then again, as a CEO at the time, as I was before I hired our follow-on CEO, you have to convince people of your passion and of its worthiness. And these are some folks who in the very, very early days when things weren't as um, obviously stable as they are now, they took a chance on me. We took a chance on each other and they, they dedicated their time and talent to Janamanon in the early days. And, and I'm grateful to all of them. None of these folks are still with the company and that's just a natural part of a startup's evolution. We've been around for eight, nine years now. Um, I've talked to most of these people on a fairly regular basis now even though they've moved on, um, we're, we're very grateful to have had their input in those early days. And then uh, Mike is uh, the bald, tall, older gentleman in the middle there. He's my follow on CEO. When I was looking for my replacement, I met with Mike. I, there was a, a great rapport. I told him candidly, which is probably a no-no in negotiation, that I said, if it's not you, I'll be very disappointed. So I showed my cards a little bit. Um, but he, I'm very fortunate to have had him uh, decide to join. He fell in love with the mission at Janamanon, and it's been really great learning in real time with real business problems under Mike's uh, wisdom, and also a feeling that I'm at the table there with him, contributing my own expertise and industry knowledge and scientific ability, and um, weighing in with my own opinions, as well as Steve's and Candace's and, and Dave's, who are also on the management team at Genomenon. So let's talk about a, a plan. I don't know if you've ever seen what this is. This is a business model canvas. And it's supposed to be, I don't know, nine feet by 12 feet or something, and you put it up in your office. Um, it's meant to be iterative. And so those are supposed to simulate post-it notes. And as a scientist, I'm embarrassed to say that I, I didn't conceive of the idea that you test hypotheses as a, as a business, but you in fact do. You don't have it all figured out. In fact, you're probably dead wrong about all of your ideas until you gather data and analyze that information. And so making and testing hypotheses as you go in a small in a entrepreneur situation or a small business, or when you're launching a new product, or again, if you're not entrepreneurial, when you're thinking about a new project within a business, think about the data Think about how you're going to measure success, what it's going to mean when you've hit something right, or how you're going to address the need to iterate as you move along. And the business model canvas is a, a facile concept for, for help there. I built out a beautiful business plan. I probably lingered too long on its aesthetics. But as I said before, what I thought I knew was just completely wrong. But there was merit in the process of going through that, thinking about it, laying down the bones. As a, as a structure upon which to iterate. And so it's less about getting your, your projections exactly right. Nobody really expects that. They, they may or may not tell you that. It's about going through that process, foreshadowing what it's going to take to get to be an X million dollar a year company, how many people you need, uh, how long it's going to take, 
What are the contingencies? What are the risks? It's the process of thinking about that that's much more uh, meritorious than actually the, the outcome. And so let's talk a little bit about some of those uh, components of the process. Again, very early, didn't know anything, really. Never been in a board meeting. Honestly, never been in a sales meeting, receiving from a salesperson. I knew nothing about business 10 years ago. And I was fortunate to be um, part of several programs, mostly chaperoned through the University of Michigan, uh, but I, I absorbed everything. I read about business. I, I listened to speakers going through their own conversations, although they focused more on the later stages of their success, learned as much as I could about every aspect of starting a business and, um, and actually practiced it. Wasn't shy, didn't let it incubate in, in my attic. I went out into the world and talked to investors and got in incrementally better uh, as well as talking to customers with how I presented things and, and even how I thought about those things. And one of those places was actually going out to a trade show. So um, I'll admit that I was ill to myself about 10 minutes before my first trade show exhibit hall opened. Uh, I was very nervous. I, did, I thought maybe uh, I was in over my head and had a lot of second guesses, but it turned out to be the best decision we had made. Get out there put yourself out there, learn from people, be unabashed about what you have and be honest with them about what they need uh, and elicit those meaningful conversations so that you can inform whatever pivoting you need to do. So this trade show and obviously all subsequent trade shows have been very successful. Uh, again, if we're talking about the difference between academics and industry, when you go to um, a scientific conference, if you've never been, it's a different world in the exhibit hall. I'd invite you to go into the exhibit hall and talk to some of the vendors, listen to their pitches, see if they ask more questions than they give you answers without you even talking once. Sort of understand how that aspect of science, the, the business of science runs, because it's free. And uh, half the time during the exhibit hall hours, they're bored. So I invite you to go out there and talk to those folks, me included, if you ever come across the Genomon booth at one of these shows. Um, early days, we needed help. Again, I was I cut my teeth in molecular diagnostics. It was obviously with a much more academic focus, far less so with a commercial focus and not at all with a pharma focus in those early days. And so we engaged some, some uh, consultancy groups. We're still working with this group, so this is by no means disparaging them. But our early conversations, uh, we asked the wrong question. And so we got the wrong answer. We basically said, is there any value in pharma for our software? And they said, no. But it turns out there's a great deal of value in our data. They just answered the question that we asked. And so if you ask too focused a question, especially of a group that, that doesn't know what you're doing and doesn't know when they receive the answer how to massage it, you have to be very careful that you actually ask the question that's going to be the most valuable when answered. And so uh, you're trained as a clinician to be sure that those are open-ended questions. And like I said before, I'm obviously doing a lot of talking because you guys are passive there, but when you're actually talking to people, you want to talk 20% of the time and listen 80% of the time. When you're trying to learn something, you need to elicit feedback. You need to get them to talk and you preferably want that to be unbiased. So when you ask closed-ended questions, as I did in my early customer discovery, I said, you need what I'm selling, don't you? And they would say, yeah, mostly out of politeness. If instead you say, tell me about your problems, uh, um, obviously you'd want to be a little bit more, <laughs> uh, a little bit more um, adept when you ask that, but tell me about what's slowing you down at work. What's frustrating you? What's causing you pain? How, how have you tried to solve it? How often do you encounter it? Those are open-end questions. And in my early customer discovery, I asked very focused, narrow questions where I was trying to get the answer I wanted. And that cost me several years of, as I said, heartache and inefficiency. There's free money. There's free money everywhere. You'd be surprised. You just have to have a decent presentation of your, your vision, of your uh, sales deck or your, your materials, and uh, you apply and there's money available, again, from state and federal funds. And I've been the beneficiary in the early days and continuing to this day of several of these resources. 
I got really good at pitching. I entered a bunch of competitions and we won them. And in those early days, that was, that was the height of success. And obviously it's much better to have paying customers, but I was able to at least sell judges of these competitions on my vision. And so that was a nice increment in my evolution toward a real company. Very, very early days, we won the first competition that we applied to and several others after that, that are shown here. And then we, we tried to get more ambitious and I'm not ashamed to say we lost. That's how you know that you're, you're, you're sort of striving at the right level. If you're always winning, you're not trying hard enough. You have to get comfortable with the idea that you're not gonna win everything so that you know that you're actually getting as much value out of the whole process as you could. We, we went even bigger and applied for what's known as an SBIR, or Small Business Innovation Research Grant from the NIH. Um, we've been the recipient of several of these at this point, and it's the hardest free money you'll have to work for, but it's totally worth it. And it's great validation from your peers who actually review this from a scientific and commercial perspective to say, yeah, this, is, this has legs. This is a good idea. It's not so safe that we're not going to give them money because it, they should just you know, seek it out elsewhere, but it's not so um, uh, harebrained as to not be feasible. So there's a nice balance that you want to strike between its plausibility and the ambition. And we've been able to consistently keep that ambition high and, and successfully apply for these SBIR grants. And then finally, we sought out investment. And um, these are not named investors. They're groups of investors, symposia, places where the investors congregate. Because as I said before, they're looking to give you money. You may have heard of this in, in the venture world. There's money looking for deals. Everybody obviously wants to be on the next Google or, or Uber or Facebook or what have you. Um, and the only way to do that is to find these companies in their embryonal very early stage. And you do this in, in hotel conference rooms with PowerPoints where you present your, your vision and you answer questions and you build a relationship and they cut you a check. Uh, not every one of them, obviously, they have an investment thesis they want to focus on healthcare. They want to do good in the world. They want to focus on uh, financial technology, what have you. But you'll eventually find a group of folks who are like-minded and actually knowledgeable. So it's not just dumb money. It's not just, here's your money, you figure it out. It's money that um, uh, they come to the table with their own expertise uh, uh, in your industry and can provide insight that you wouldn't otherwise get if you were on your own. And so I think I'm coming toward the end of my slides here, which is great because I, I really wanna see if there's any questions from anybody in the room. There's something called product market fit. And so if you've ever seen an old timey cartoon or, or black and white movie where there's a room full of mouse traps and you throw something in the middle and everything just starts snapping in, in a crazy chaos, that's what product market fit really is. Um, it, when the term was coined, it really meant to say when everything is going so fast that you, you can't keep up, that's how you know that you've really hit on something where you, the market is ready for the product that you're selling. And you need to start thinking very seriously about how quickly you're going to scale without the wheels falling off your bus. And so I'm very fortunate to say that that's where we're at with Genomenon. It has taken a while mostly because of my inexperience, but also because of how conservative the, the market is. Many of our customers now, we're literally waiting to see if we survived. Rather than take our software and our data and embed it in their processes, they wanted to see, I don't know that I trust this startup or that startup or any other startup until I see that they have what it takes to stick around. And now that we've gained that confidence, they've seen our, our data, they've seen the value, they know our software, they know that we're around for a while, we're really starting to hit uh, an inflection point. We had hit an inflection point in the clinic, we're having that same inflection point in our other market, which is on the pharma side. And so product market fit is a happy place to be. It's very heady. And anybody on my team will tell you that we're very, very busy. So it's, it's extremely exciting to be in the place where we're at. And I'll, I'll, I'll re-emphasize that I'm very privileged to work with the folks that I work with on, on my team and the company in general. And so um, just to bring it back home, I think this is my last slide. The problem should be get the product. Customers and cash are necessary. The people that you hire and work with are essential. 
but the process is where a, a really uh, expert entrepreneur focuses their attention. And that is my last slide. So if, if you're too shy to, to talk to me or you've got a really specific question, please do uh, reach out to me by email. Otherwise, I'm happy to entertain any questions that anybody has. Thank you so much, Mark. Yes, anyone in the room, if you have a question, please feel free to literally raise your hand. Uh, if you are on Zoom only, please feel free to use the raise hand feature and we will call on you to ask your question. Ah, Anushka, it looks like you have a question. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask. I, I wanted to uh, check with about how uh, financial aspects of leading a startup works out because apart from um, getting the funds for the startup, it also has to do with personal financial situations and making oh, yeah. commitment. So just wanted to understand um, how that looks like and what kind of a commitment and risk you sign up for. Good. That's an excellent question. And everybody's different. So you, you embedded that in the question. That's excellent. I had a family. I had three hungry mouths to feed. And I had no savings, but by virtue of my long academic training. And so I needed to not miss a paycheck. There are other folks in their 20s who are single, who are more resilient than I was in their current situation, who could go without a paycheck for a number of months or live on ramen in a you know, dingy apartment. So I needed to have no break in my pay. And that definitely informed how urgent I needed to get funding and on what terms. Um, but I'll, I'll magnify that by saying that the most expensive component of most startups, particularly IT startups, is the people. There's very little manufacturing costs or resource costs. You don't need an office. You don't need putt-putt greenery in some eight large atrium or anything. It's all about paying people. And the way that you pay people usually in a startup is under market rate, but with a promise of a portion of the company or equity. So I don't know if, if this is um, a familiar territory for everybody, but there's a trade-off there between what you're being remunerated in cash to pay your living expenses uh, and you know perhaps even for savings versus what you're promised in the future should your company be successful. And so there's a whole conversation about how you trade off the financial like um, uh, salary aspect of, of bringing new employees on board and how you give them a piece of the company pie. But from your own personal perspective, the first round of funding usually comes from the three Fs, friends, family, and fools. And that's very fraught. So be, be careful how you take money especially from family and friends, they should know that the money they're giving you is not going to come back to them, is a lottery ticket. They're giving it to you because of your passion and the hope that you're going to be successful, but they should get comfortable with the idea that it is, it is unlikely to materialize in something. That way you'll preserve your family and, and friend relationships. So those are a couple things that I'd say in answer to your question. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. All right, any other questions? Yes. I couldn't, I couldn't understand any of that. So hopefully somebody can translate it for me. Because I, 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 um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that, that didn't reach the computer up here. Um, so she's saying that she's had an idea for an app for quite a while now. And okay. Either you yourself or anyone at your company would be interested in being a mentor and maybe more specifically yeah. about getting a mentorship relationship. I would love it. So yeah, don't be shy. Uh, I got a lot of stuff to say about your app. Um, the one thing that I'll say for, for the group here is the faster you can get to know this doesn't work or this is what you should do instead, the better off you'll be. So don't get married to your app. Don't fall in love with your app. What is your goal? 
your goal, it may be to start a company, maybe to be financially secure, maybe effectuate this kind of change in the world. Your app might be the wrong way to do it. And the faster you can come to that realization, the better. So make those hypotheses, test them as quickly as you can. Don't get disappointed if it's not the app of your dreams. It, I, it happened to me. It's hard. So that's tough advice. I'd be happy to, to be your mentor and give you some guidance about the best way to do that um, so that you don't waste years of time otherwise. So I don't know who you are. <laughs> I don't know how to reach you. My email's up there. Don't be shy. Great. Thank you. Um, we probably have time for one more question. So if we have one more, we can wrap up. Anyone on Zoom? Yeah. Anybody? Hi. Yes. Yeah, sorry. We're coming up to the computer. So I was wondering, what are some of the key characteristics or skills that you look for in employees in your startup? So kind of on the other side, rather than the founder, the startup. Yep. Yep. So it's, it's still coachability. So uh, a willingness and an appetite, for, a willingness to grow and an appetite for growth. Uh, and uh, I'll mention again, without names, so as not to embarrass, but we, we've got some folks from KGI that we're very, very pleased to have on board with us. Um, but also, in addition to that, growth mindset, uh, interest in learning is um, a pragmatism. So there's a, a, a hearkening back to the, the nature of this talk. In academics, it's easy to linger on an experiment idea for a year. It's easy to want everything to be perfect and precise. And when you're in industry, things move much more quickly and they, they shift for um, pragmatic, real reasons, not theoretical reasons. So there's, there's a real risk as an academician that you'll have perfection palsy and not make decisions and, and not be able to, to um, effectuate fast change. On the, on the business side, we need people to have what I've called um, pragmatic perfection. They know what's perfect, but they're also practical about what the minimum component of that perfection is what they should focus on so that they don't wait for a year to make that change. And again, in reference to that previous question, don't try to make your app perfect before you talk to people about it. You want to test things, pressure test them, get them out there before, um, before you waste many months lingering on things that probably don't matter in the end. And so the best employees that we've had have a very practical outlook on things and can weigh the decisions from multiple angles, not just a scientific one, because in a business, there are multiple other contingencies that you need to be mindful of. So that, that would be what I'd say is a more broad view, less focused on science, although it's very important in a, in a science or healthcare IT company, but also taking into account all these other components. Um, th those kind of employees I've seen be the most successful. Thank you so much for giving us your time today, Mark. This has been a really interesting talk for all of us included, I'm sure. So thank you again. Um, we are getting kicked out of our room for the next time. <laughs> So thank you again for, for sharing with us and everyone. Thanks all.